there in the field and uh, the messenger has taken the message to the house and they are preparing for the final ceremonies and uh, he is observing what's happening uh, uh, from up there and uh, then uh, to see that uh, the family comes to the uh, uh, to the farming land and they take the body over to the to the house and now they are doing the rituals for the um, final ceremony of this beloved son uh, when this happens uh, everyone seems so calm and quiet uh, they don't seem to be uh, grieving as they should have usually that you would expect uh, no one is uh, shedding a tear everyone is calm uh, everyone is doing uh, what has to be done so this uh, Brahma uh, is now a little confused he really wants to check are they really grieving or are they not so the Brahma takes another form as a, as a man and, they, uh, and he comes and approaches the father and asks the father um, what has happened here are you going to uh, uh, are you going to have a final ceremony of a any uh, is it someone that you don't know then the father answers, no, this is my beloved son. Uh, and the uh, Brahma uh, asks, uh, so if it's your beloved son, why is that no one is shedding a tear? It doesn't uh, feel like it's a funeral house at all. Everyone seems to be very calm and quiet, composed. Uh, are you sure that it's your beloved son? Do, uh, are, you not, are you sure that it's not an enemy of yours? And then the, son say, uh, the, the father says, yes, it's my beloved son but uh, i do not uh, choose to lament or grieve uh, by crying sobbing you know doing all that over the dead body of my son simply because it's like uh, this is his body like a snake has shed his skin and uh, left to another uh, skin or another form this is the skin uh, or the shedded uh, skin of that uh, snake and uh, this body does not feel anything so because I know that I'm not lamenting over this, uh, I'm not grieving over this dead body. So the Brahma uh, is not satisfied. He moves on to the mother and asks, uh, isn't this your beloved son? Then the mother says, uh, my son did not come to this world with an invitation, neither he left without, with permission. So he didn't come with our invitation, neither he left with uh, our permission. So for something like that, why should I grieve? Why should I uh, cry over the dead body of my son? I don't do that. Although he's my beloved son, I do not do that. Then the Brahma approaches the sister who's uh, there. So he asks, uh, why aren't you crying? Uh, isn't uh, isn't, your, isn't uh, he your beloved brother? Uh, she says, uh, well, uh, I know that my uh, beloved brother has passed away, but nothing I do, anything I do would not bring him back. Uh, regardless of whether I cry, whether I uh, be so sad about it, nothing will happen except I'll be uh, so slim and I'll be imaginated, you know, I'll be uh, uh, worried. Uh, that's, what all, that's all what would happen. Uh, my brother would not come back. So because of that, I do not lament over his dead body. And the uh, um, Brahma approaches the wife of the, uh, of the departed. She says, well, uh, when we were young, uh, I would have seen that uh, young, young children, the children, they would uh, show you the moon and uh, tell mother, father, I want this moon. But uh, we know it's, it's not possible. So even if I look at my uh, beloved husband's dead body, and if I uh, request from anyone that uh, please bring him back, it's not going to happen. So I'm moving on. I'm not going to uh, lament over his dead body. Then Brahma also approaches the servant who has uh, been raising the, uh, the, the son, uh, the prince, uh, the, the servant who has been uh, raising him. So she gives an even wonderful answer. Aren't you sad that it's your master who's dead, who you have been uh, taking care of since his uh, childhood, since his infancy? Well, I'm not going to do that because uh, if I, when I'm working at my uh, station in the kitchen, uh, what if a clay pot, what if uh, by mistake I drop a clay pot? 
uh, and if it's uh, shattered into pieces, uh, even if I cry, even if I lament, it's not going to go back to its original form and uh, be the original clay pot because once shattered, it's shattered. So no matter how much I uh, cry, it's not going to bring my master back. So because of that reason, I do not want to lament over the dead body of my son. So goes the uh, Uraga Jatakaya. In fact, uh, Uraga Jatakaya is uh, the last of this Uraga uh, Vagdaya, which comprises of many such stories, of many such stories, uh, about seven of them, if I'm not mistaken, where people uh, come across uh, situations where they had to grieve. And uh, also there have been pre people who have uh, taken it in a different uh, nature. They have taken it uh, in a different uh, manner. And uh, so once this uh, Dharmapala Jataka or Dharmapala uh, context was uh, uh, said to the uh, said uh, father who's, who was lamenting over the uh, death of the son, he understands the reality of the nature. And uh, then uh, they say that he uh, became enlightened. Uh, he became a so on person. Uh, so this is a story. But I know that uh, when, we are when we are faced with uh, practical issues, traumas, where you have to uh, be upset about it. Now, it could be something from uh, breaking a glass, breaking your uh, vase, to having someone departed who's, who's the most beloved of yours. Let me uh, draw your mind to something. Uh, when so something like that happens, we also face uh, certain stages of reacting to that uh, incident or that occurrence. So this is even sometimes uh, uh, commonly discussed in uh, modern uh, psychology as stages of grieving. And uh, there's a lot of argument about uh, why it is good and why it is not. But uh, what's important is the observation that we can uh, learn from uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this particular uh, thing. And uh, what happens is uh, when uh, something adverse happens, right? Say uh, a death of someone that uh, was beloved. Uh, I saw, I was watching TV recently, not recently, sometime back. Then uh, I happened to see during the uh, bomb threat Sri Lanka had, there was this father who was uh, uh, going, to, going to school with his son or daughter. And then uh, there has been a policeman who was guarding the uh, gate. Apparently, there has been some mix-up. And the, the father was killed. Uh, his father was shot accidentally. Um, and uh, then the TV channels, you know, they are, they are not quite ethical in doing uh, certain things. But they have been showing the uh, house of the departed, how the wife and the mother are grieving over the death. And the first reaction they would... Uh, have is that uh, I do not believe that my uh, husband departed. I, I simply cannot believe that. You know, he was just here this morning. He had breakfast with me. Uh, I do not believe that uh, this happened. For most of us, the natural reaction for a very adverse uh, occurring or, a, or an incident is that we do not want to believe that. We deny that. We are in denial. We do not... Uh, want to accept that this happened. So the first reaction is, no, it's impossible. This could not have happened. It is not possible. But then on, then uh, I saw uh, the, the uh, incident further on. Then uh, you would see that uh, the body of that uh, deceased husband was taken to the house. And now the wife and the mother, they see the, see the body. They have to sort of accept that the person is dead. And when that happens, they get really uh, upset about it. They get angry about it. They want to find justice to what happened. So then uh, I'm just uh, taking this example, but this could have been the example for many of us. Then we try to uh, blame it on uh, someone and find justice with that. So our, our denial sort of uh, transforms to an anger, uh, to an agitation, and we are angry. And we want to find, uh, we want to do justice to the one who's deceased. Um, even if something like this happens, say uh, one of your beloved uh, person is uh, deceased, departed from you, 
The first reaction would be that uh, I do not believe this happened. He was just here with me uh, yesterday, day before, two hours ago, and I do not want to believe that. And uh, if somehow you have to believe that that person is gone, then uh, your natural reaction would be, has the doctors done something wrong? Has the police done something wrong? Is it the government? Is it uh, someone? Is there someone to be blamed for this? Has uh, justice not been served for this person? Has the doctors not have done enough? Um, is it the God? Is it the God who uh, made this uh, uh, very uh, unlikable uh, event happen? Is he the one who is to be blamed? Is it the karma? What is to be blamed? And if it is someone that uh, can I fight him? Can I uh, uh, use all my power? And then can I make justice, uh, uh, do justice for the person who's departed? Can I do that? That would be a secondary reaction. And further on you go, you would find that uh, uh, no matter you try to uh, do, do right by the person who's dead, uh, you still can't uh, make that person wake up. Once he's gone, like that clay pot, once shattered, is shattered, is uh, departed, or she's departed. When this happens, we try to bargain, or we try to sort of, uh, uh, sort of channel the blame towards us. Could I have done uh, a little more? Could I, could I have done a little more to keep this person alive? Is it my fault? Had I done this, would this would not be happening? So we try to sort of bargaining on what uh, happened, and we see if there's uh, uh, anything else that we could have done. Still, it doesn't work because the person who's dead uh, departed has departed. Then we sort of get into a depressive state of mind where we could we can't uh, eat, we can't sleep. Like that uh, person uh, that Buddha was uh, uh, talking about, about the teaching about the Dharmapala Sutra. Uh, we can't focus on anything. We lose track of our daily uh, routine. Uh, we can't attend to our job. Uh, we can't even sleep properly. Uh, everywhere we see, uh, whenever we see something which reminds of our departed uh, person, we get into this uh, depressive mood. So this mode could go on and uh, eventually, few years later, one year, six months, two years, three years, five years, ten years later, eventually you would move on, you will reintegrate back to the uh, previous life and then you will start uh, moving on. Now what I want to uh, show is that uh, these stages could occur, but not necessarily uh, one after the other. Also, uh, it doesn't uh, have to be a set. It doesn't have to be a set period where one is stuck at a particular stage. Uh, for example, if you watch news again, you will see that there are uh, uh, rallies done by uh, parents uh, who bring uh, boards to the Lipton Circle and say, "My son is missing. Uh, he has been missing for the last 20 years. I still believe that he's there. Please bring him back." Some people do not want to believe that, uh, even accept that he's departed or she's departed. I still believe that he's somewhere, he's somewhere, please bring my son back to me. And uh, you could even see that some people uh, want to take revenge of the one who's uh, diseased and do right by him. Uh, in fact, uh, there's this famous prisoner in Sri Lanka uh, I can't recall his name, but uh, he has this very famous tattoo. He has this uh, thing called Itumateji. Uh, if you look into his story, his, uh, 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 his account of his life, he has been trying to uh, avenge his sister who was uh, killed in a very uh, unjustful manner. He, he has been trying to avenge his sister for a quite long time, almost his entire uh, adult lifehood. Uh, getting into the prison, breaking from the prison, and then trying to uh, go after one after the other. And he was he was avenging that uh, death for the entire lifetime, entire adulthood, since uh, 20 years until I think uh, 50, 60 years, he has been trying to uh, take revenge on that uh, sister, a sister's uh, uh, killers. Some people go into depression and they do not want to wake up for quite a long time, for 10 years. 
furious. They would even uh, go to extremes. Uh, for some people, they move on in these uh, stages quite fast. It could be two years, it could be one year, but uh, most likely bulk of the people, 95% of the people, 99% of the people you will see that uh, they move on. How do we know that uh, we have moved on, that uh, we sort of get used to the new reality, that we need to accept that uh, this person is no more with us, uh, he's, uh, this person is gone and uh, we need to really accept that uh, uh, we can't do anything about this. But uh, having said that, we need to accept what has happened has happened and move on, which is not an easy, easy task. And uh, uh, there are a few things that we can uh, look at uh, what happens when we are trying to sort of accept this new reality. Uh, often what would happen is that uh, we come up with our own coping mechanism. And the uh, coping mechanism is our natural reaction for us to uh, not be upset. In fact, uh, I can't remember who said this, but uh, someone has said uh, that uh, the very cave that we are afraid to enter is the one you are looking for, like uh, Nirvana, like uh, enlightenment. That's the one thing that you love uh, most, but it's the one thing that you are most afraid of at the same time. I'll tell you why. Um, when these things are happening, when we are in initial shock, when we are um, in denial, when we are in uh, frustration, when we are in bargaining, when we are in depression, and then we move on, uh, what really changes is only our mind. What has happened hasn't really changed. And that's what this uh, Dharma Pada Brahmanya says. Uh, it's like a shattered uh, clay pot. It has happened. And there's no coming back. My brother has uh, left the world. No matter how much I cry, it's not going to come back. But the thing is that uh, it's look, it looks quite rational, it looks logical, but when it happens, I can't accept that, which is perfect. And uh, even uh, in my life, I have uh, come across adverse situations. Well, not dead, but uh, certain adverse situations. I'm sure that every one of you has gone through some adverse situation. That... Uh, when that happens, we can't really uh, rationalize it. We can't think uh, like Dharmapala Brahmanaya. We tend to grieve, we lament over that. And uh, at the same time, uh, now having said the Dhamma Chakrapatra Sutra also, let me tell you something about our mind. Uh, our mind is very simple. Uh, it has a positive side and a negative side. A positive side of uh, what we love and a negative side of what we reject or repulse. Uh, so we reject certain things and we accept certain things. When the things that we accept are near us, around us, now I'm not only talking about uh, physical things, but it could be even a uh, thought. Uh, when something that we like is around us, we feel happy. Uh, when something comes around us, which we do not like, which we have rejected, then we feel sad. Uh, uh, when a loud form is around you, it doesn't have to be a person, it can be uh, a hobby, it can be a, uh, an artifact, it can be an animated thing, it can be even thought, a mere thought, a, even a mere thought is enough. If it's around you, you are feeling happy. When it's taken away from you, when it's uh, diminishing, when it's going away, you feel sad. Or if something is uh, coming into uh, interaction with you, which is uh, uh, not something that you like, something that you don't like, then you feel a great rejection, a repulsion. Uh, often, uh, we can categorize these feelings as uh, anger, frustration, uh, dislike, etc., etc. And uh, on the positive side, the happiness, uh, joyfulness, uh, acceptance, all that side. If you take a year, if you take uh, 2020, 2019, for example, because 2020, you can't uh, uh, take it as a year because uh, that year has been a quite different year compared to the, all the other years that you have spent. So if you take 2019, January, February, March, April, so on, you would see that certain months uh, have been positive. 
certain other months have been negative. What I'm saying is that certain months you felt uh, nice about your existence. Uh, that month was good. But certain months were uh, quite depressive. They even say, especially that uh, you are living in a country where the seasonality is there, uh, researchers say that uh, when the summer approaches, people are quite uh, happy, they're joyful. But when the winter approaches, people get a little uh, moody, depressive. Uh, so that's the year. If you take a month, you know that uh, around the time the salary is uh, in your bank account, or the, around the week that your salary comes to your bank account, you are happy. And uh, towards the last bit, you find uh, it quite uh, depressing. If you take a week, uh, weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, is beautiful. We love it. But uh, towards Monday, Tuesday, it's hard. We hate it. And uh, if you take even today, I think it's uh, late evening in your country, uh, from the morning to evening, certain parts of the certain hours has been uh, very nice, where I liked it, and certain hours has been uh, not so nice, uh, even could be a little depressive. And uh, such is our mind, such is our conscious experience. Now, why do I say the conscious experience? Our life, if you really think about it, uh, is really about uh, the time that we spend or the experience that we have while we are awake. I'll uh, reiterate that. Even the sleep you have is not part of your experience. Now, I slept uh, a while ago for, uh, for two hours today, but uh, the sleeping is not an experience for me. The experience is uh, a moment before I fall asleep and right when I wake up. That's my conscious experience. If you have gone through anesthesia, you would uh, uh, anesthetic. So you know, if you have been uh, been unconscious, you would know that unconscious unconsciousness is not an experience. It's an extrapolation or uh, or, or something that you uh, think based on your conscious experience. Um, so your conscious experience or your experience when you are awake is that that uh, you find certain uh, good parts, positive parts, uh, nice parts, and then you find these negative parts, or you find the neutral parts. Uh, if, uh, if, if it's uh, not any of these, you are either sleeping or you are unconscious. That's your experience. And your entire life has revolved around this experience. The experience that you, you have when you are awake, and uh, within this experience, you have uh, sensory experience, visual experience, audio experiences, uh, experiences uh, in thinking, and that's our experience. And within this experience, again, there's a positive side and a negative side. So what often happens is that, um, what I wanted to say earlier is that if you take an year, if you take a month, a day, uh, even an hour, even uh, from start to end of this uh, uh, was uh, sermon. You would find that our mind uh, sometimes stay on the positive side, sometimes goes to the negative side. And uh, our mind is in a continuous uh, fluctuation, like a sine curve, where it goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down. Uh, if you don't know what a sine curve is, it's like the waves of the uh, ocean, goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, right? And uh, the good thing about it is that uh, what goes up has to go down. What goes down has to go up. So one after the other, it's up and a down, up and a down. It would never be up or never be down. It would be definitely uh, up if it's down, down if it's up. And that's the simple truth of a conscious experience. That's, that's the uh, reality or the observation that we can make our, about our experience of life. Um, improportionate and uh, very, very unproportionately responds to uh, what's happening around him. And he would react much further than the, and then you would say that this person is uh, mad, right? Uh, the same thing could happen on the downward side. Uh, for the slightest thing, this person gets really uh, depressed even to a point where uh, he or she 
uh, questions about the existence, right? So when it goes to that rock bottom, they say this person is uh, depressed, chronically depressed, uh, bipolar, whatever you, uh, whatever the psychologists say. We know this behavior. Even if we are not clinically diagnosed as uh, maniacs or uh, depressed people, then we know this this uh, has occurred uh, definitely in our lifetime. Probably yesterday, probably a month ago, uh, probably a year ago, this has happened. And uh, so again, uh, how we would define uh, clinically insane people is that when they uh, go above and beyond a certain uh, limit, but if you see that uh, most of us, uh, we are somewhat uh, crazy. In other words, we are, we are sort of crazy. And uh, there's a nice phrase in Singhala. I, I hope that everyone understands Singhala. Um, a person who's crazy, or oh, the, the saying is that is so not a doctor kalabalavin. The crazy person gets uh, agitated, but the doctors doesn't get agitated. And why is that? The crazy person doesn't uh, understand the nature of the mind. The doctor, on the other hand, he knows. He does not get panicked. Uh, he's calm, composed. He knows what has to be done. Uh, suppose that there's an injury where there's a fracture, a compound fracture, where your bone is sticking out of your leg or arm or whatever the limb. Usually, the usual reaction, whether you feel pain or not, you get agitated, you get uh, so um, traumatized. That's your natural reaction. But an orthopedic surgeon, I'm sure that uh, some of you uh, are probably doctors, they do not get panicked. They know what has to be done. Uh, they know that uh, you have to treat this. You need to uh, do certain things, A, B, C, D things, uh, in order to uh, do the corrective action. So they do not panic. And why is that they do not panic? Because they understand the nature of these things. They have learned uh, extensively uh, in the medical school. They have, uh, uh, they have had a lot of experience, uh, clinical experience, so they know how to handle this. So they do not panic. And uh, simply because we do not know the nature of our mind, we panic. And a person who understands all corners of our mind, in other words, our existence, do not panic. He does not panic for the good. He does not get uh, agitated for the bad. Uh, whatever which comes his way, he or she is not agitated, does not get shocked. And uh, let me tell you another example. Suppose that uh, um, you have to go to sleep today and tomorrow when you wake up, you wake up in a totally unfamiliar setting. You know, you wake up in a mansion which you have not seen before or, or a totally unfamiliar setup. Your natural reaction would be to get a little panicked, right? Um, but it, happy, it, happy, it happened to be, it, it's your cozy bedroom that uh, you know inside out. You would not panic. You would find comfort. In it. You would find comfort. Whereas on the other occasion, you would find panicking. Same thing happens to us. When we are faced with an uh, emotion, with an uh, atrocity, an adverse effect, we wake up in a place we have not seen before, where we are not very familiar. And like I said, the very cave that we are afraid to enter is the one we are really looking for, and that's in our mind. We do not know the uh, size and uh, we do not know the length and breadth of our mind. So we get uh, afraid, we get scared, and we have a panic reaction, not a composed reaction like the doctor who knows inside out of the fractured bone. We have a panic reaction uh, to uh, the new setting that we see, simply because we do not understand, understand uh, the nature of our mind. Simple as uh, it may sound, it's not simple. And why it's not simple uh, is because it's so simple. Now it might uh, come as a uh, come as a uh, oxymoron, you know. It's so simple, and because of its simplicity, we we cannot see this. We cannot see uh, past this. And uh, when our uh, mind is in shock, 
what really causes that shock? Is it the incident which happened, or is that uh, it's some natural reaction to it, right? Or is it that we are waking up uh, inside our mind to a total unfamiliar setting or an unfamiliar surrounding? Having said that, again, um, our mind, another nature of our mind, is that it's very habitual. It's our entire existence is actually a habit. I'm sure that uh, had it been uh, not a Zoom discussion, uh, if you are really in uh, the Wellington uh, Meditation Center, uh, you would be seated in front of me, and then you would be seated in a particular way, right? Uh, you'd be wearing uh, white clothing, more, most likely, and uh, you'd be even having your hands together like this, uh, and you'd be even uh, nodding your head in a certain way. If you really look at uh, why we do that, it's actually a habit. That's the habit that we have been trained. And I'm sure that you meet a lot of uh, foreign people over there. They would not have the same reaction as you would have uh, if they come to a temple, right? So if you look at that way, our entire existence is uh, a response uh, to an action, which is very habitual, right? Um, take, for example, uh, what you do right after when you wake up. For most of the people, it would be uh, taking the phone, checking the messages that you have received, checking uh, social media, what are the notifications, and then, uh, you know, doing ABCD things. Or it could be waking up in the morning, uh, doing a yoga stretch, and then uh, getting on. Or what if someone, what if uh, your parent or your child comes and screams at you early in the morning? Your natural reaction would be to get mad. Uh, very few people uh, have the natural reaction to smile when someone uh, says something uh, bad to your face, right? So if you really look at it, it's the way we, are, we have uh, uh, sort of uh, opted to behave to a certain incident. It's a reaction. And same goes with the um, funeral event. Now I know like uh, most of the time when uh, uh, we used to be in the university, uh, Marutu University with uh, Anurudh Tero, um, we would uh, go on numerous trips uh, for uh, funerals of our batchmates. And uh, we know that uh, when we get off from the university property, uh, during the bus ride, uh, we, we hire a bus, if, uh, the entire batch is in that bus. We would do all sorts of things, drinking, singing, you know, all sorts of things. We are very happy. And uh, when we reach Mathura, where the funeral is, all of a sudden, everyone gets into this mood. They do not even uh, make a joke, uh, serious faces, long faces. And that's how we react. And that's our habit to be in a uh, funeral house. Uh, recently, I saw in social media that there's this uh, group where they do a coffin dance. Uh, they do a dance uh, when they're carrying the dead body. And uh, uh, I have seen that in some African country, their ritual uh, is to throw a big party to the dead person. Because what they believe is that this person has uh, left this world uh, in order to go to a better world. So assume that, uh, you know, most of you are Sri Lankans, I mean, first generation uh, Canadian citizens probably. Uh, when you left to Canada, I'm sure that uh, most of your relative, uh, relatives threw you apart. Our beloved person is going to this uh, beautiful country, uh, 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 what you call a first world country. So let us throw a party. So they were happy about it. But when it comes to death, uh, we don't do that. Um, we are not uh, uh, showing our response in that way, but our natural response is to cry, right? And if you again look at why we do that, if you look at inside your mind, you would find that it's just mostly a habit for most of us, not for the directly affected people, but for most of us. I'll tell you why. <clears throat> couple, of, couple of days ago, uh, about a week ago, uh, a couple came to see me uh, they were having a sort of a family issue and uh, I asked uh, where the family issue has stemmed. It has started from the phobia this uh, lady has uh, of cockroaches. 
Now she's not afraid of snakes. She's not afraid of uh, uh, you know more scary uh, creatures, uh, but she's afraid of cockroaches. And then uh, while I was talking to her, she was uh, revealing what's inside her mind. And then uh, uh, she was telling to me that uh, you know I wasn't really afraid of cockroaches uh, throughout my entire life. In fact, when I was a child, it wasn't the case. But I remember one incident. I remember this uh, very traumatic incident. Uh, we had a servant, and uh, she was super afraid of these cockroaches. So she would run away when uh, she sees a cockroach, and my sister would follow. So I would be scared of them. Right. So you know, by default, I uh, before I became a monk, I had a son. Uh, he was not afraid of uh, cockroaches or caterpillars or whatever. In fact, uh, if you look at some small children, they would just grab the insect and even try to put that insect in mouth. That that's their natural uh, habit. That's their natural response. But when we see our audience or our our surrounding, our parents, our caretakers are reacting to that in a, a different emotions, we try to mirror that emotion. And. Uh, uh, People say the behavioral psychologists even say that it's a uh, coping mechanism. That's how we learn, because uh, uh, that's how we move forward. That's how we learn and uh, uh, move forward in life. That's a mechanism of learning. So we sort of uh, reflect or we mirror the emotions of the people that we see in front of us when we are quite young, right? Uh, and based on these uh, emotions of other people. Uh, we develop this habit of uh, responding to activities or, or incidents when it's uh, when we are faced with that incident. So again, uh, if we look at the stages of our grieving, grieving the initial uh, initial shock and uh, not want to believe that it happened, the initial anger, initial uh, depression, you know, and then finally moving on. These could be habits. These could be habitual. But again, let me tell again and again. Although we look at these things when we have moved on, these do not apply when we are in the situation. For example, uh, if we are on a stream and if we are struggling to uh, reach one of the banks, we can't uh, really uh, enjoy the way the river is flowing, or we can't uh, see the beauty of the river. Because we are struggling in the stream, we are struggling in these emotions. But if you somehow reach one of the banks and then you look at the river, the same river, you will see how beautiful it's flowing. The the flowers, the uh, blue water, you know, it, it looks so beautiful. But when we are in the stream trying to reach a bank, it's not possible. So one needs to understand that if you are struggling in this stream of uh, emotions, first you need to reach a bank. And in order to reach a bank, one can uh, do many things, starting from uh, talking, right? So again, uh, it's, it's sort of a coping mechanism that uh, whenever we want to heal ourselves, there's many ways that we uh, employ uh, to do that. And also there are many behaviors that we can see when uh, something like this happens. And if you look at Tripita Kaya, if you look at uh, Uddhaka Nikaya and Uttar Nikaya, you find all these stories about how people have uh, responded to different uh, incidents. For example, one lady loses her entire family and she's acting as if she's really insane, right? And uh, one uh, merchant has lost his son. He's lamenting, grieving, like uh, there's no future for him, right? So all these uh, uh, reactions to adversities which are happening, we can see through these stories, we can uh, see this when uh, we turn on the television, when we turn on the uh, news, we see this in our day-to-day -day life, we see it happening to our relatives, to ourselves, but most of the time we do not see it happening to ourselves, we uh, see it happening to other people. So again, let me uh, take a few examples of uh, what a person would do when certain things happen. Uh, suppose that you are uh, we are faced with a very traumatizing event. Someone could uh, behave in a different manner. Someone could behave in a few ways. Uh, if you are facing with a uh, angry situation, if you are mad at someone, 
is. Uh, but you know that you can't be really doing anything about it. You can project that same value to someone else. Even if you're mad at yourself, have I not been uh, doing enough to prevent this incident or the adversity occurring? I could project the same uh, anger towards someone else. Classic case happens when uh, I have seen that, uh, I have seen this uh, when I was uh, about to get married, uh, just the day before, my mother was furious. Uh, she was really mad at uh, my brother, my father, um, and to see that she really misses me, she has missed me, but she cannot uh, directly focus it to me or the future uh, daughter-in-law, which is uh, politically very, very un incorrect. So she focuses on someone else that uh, she could project. And as uh, relatives, as uh, people who are around a person who's grieving, we need to understand that sometimes this could happen. A traumatizing event, uh, a person where he's, he or she is upset about himself, about uh, not having uh, uh, done anything uh, enough for the person who has departed or for that uh, particular traumatizing event, he could channel, he or she could channel his anger, frustration on someone totally unrelated. It could be even the milkman who comes and says good morning. It can be a totally unrelated person. And uh, naturally, if you get blamed for something uh, you do not deserve, our natural reaction is to retaliate. But uh, as uh, people who are more compassionate, we need to understand when someone uh, uh, does that, maybe that person has a deeper uh, emotional agitation and that's that's, that is the emotional ag agitation venting out and we need to be uh, compassionate about it. We need to be um, uh, careful about uh, handling that person. We need to be, uh, we need to really try to understand that person from the shoes that uh, he or she is in. So that's something uh, which could happen. Also, uh, there could be things like we are trying to self-convince through a rationale. For example, uh, it's the nature that uh, everything uh, goes into its original form. Uh, if you are made out of uh, earth and sand and water, it's a natural way that it's, uh, it's, it's going away. So we can uh, have some rationalization. Often, you see that a lot of people use religion for this rationalization to move on, right? Uh, it's the karma. It's the wish of the God. Uh, it's the way it has happened. So we use this uh, rationalization uh, to move on from that uh, traumatic incident. And uh, well, there's a, there's a good side to it. There's a bad side to it. Sometimes this uh, can be an over -intellectual, in intellectualization. You could uh, go overboard with it. In fact, I have seen that uh, many people who approach me at the temple uh, they say, uh, Swami Mahal, sir, we are interested in learning Buddhism. We are interested in learning uh, Paticca Samuppadya. We are interested in learning uh, Satis Bodhikaksika Dharma from you. But if you really see that that person is not really uh, looking for that, that person is uh, approaching us to find solace uh, to an unsettling uh, emotion that person has. And that is what Dharma, that is what uh, Buddha's uh, teaching is exactly for to find solace, to find this supreme bliss inside your mind. And uh, having said that again, you, would, uh, you could see that uh, having a solace and having a permanent solution are entirely two different things. But in order for us to go for a permanent solution, we need to have a solace. So it's very important that uh, we make use of uh, our beliefs, our religion, our friends, our other things. Like for example, um, doing an exercise or going out uh, on a trip or even uh, something like uh, looking at uh, uh, a soap. Like uh, I see that there's a lot of uh, dramas uh, in Sri Lanka. I'm sure some of you are watching these dramas, like the mega dramas. When you look at uh, their problems, for a moment you forget your problem, right? And uh, you sort of uh, uh, think, well, this person is so uh, naive, this person is so stupid. Uh, those are the actors I'm talking about in the uh, soap uh, drama. You think about them, and for that moment, you find uh, relief in your own problem. Go for it, which is a very good thing, because doing that, you find great relief, at least uh, momentarily. 
right? So I don't know what uh, what 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 is the best uh, answer for you, but you can try out all these things. You can try yoga. You can try meditation. You can try taking a picnic. You can try uh, in in uh, New Zealand. There's this thing uh, hugging a uh, uh, hugging a tree. I'm sure it's in Canada also. Go hug a tree. Uh, go pet animals. Go to a petting zoo. Talk to your friends. Play a sport. Get off. Get get your mind off uh, what's bothering you. Find solace in that. You will find solace in that, but the next time it happens again, it will be affecting you, and the same thing would happen. So that's why we need to sort of go for a more uh, long-lasting uh, liberation of our uh, mind patterns. But first, things has to be done first. Uh, suppose that uh, you have a headache, a great headache. Uh, you can take Panadol, right? A paracetamol. It doesn't work. So then you take Bisprin. It still doesn't work. Then you go for ibuprofen. It works, right? So you try what's working for you. Take ibuprofen. But what's really uh, giving you the headache is not uh, the headache. It's just a symptom. You have a tumor. You need to treat the tumor, right? Same thing applies uh, to our lamenting. Uh, it's very important that we find uh, solace first. But finding solace is not the end of the story because. The next time it occurs, the same you would go, be going through the same cycle again. And why I'm saying that is that I mentioned that our life is ups and downs, right? If you pass a certain threshold, you are called uh, clinically insane. But uh, every one of us are every one of uh, us are insane in one way or the other. If your life doesn't uh, go way up or way down, if the curve is somewhat flattened. Uh, one could even say that we have reached uh, emotional stability, that we are more emotionally intelligent. In fact, uh, you see that uh, there's different indications uh, where Westerners uh, measure people. Uh, one is IQ, intelligent quotient. Uh, the other is uh, emotional quotient or emotional intelligence. And I have seen that the latest uh, sort of corporate related uh, indicator that they, that's the adversity quotient, AQ. Right, and it's fantastic to see that adversity quotient is uh, really about how you react to adverse adversities. Dukkha uh, sapa, yasaya sa, ninda prashansa. How you react to the atalo daham? How you react to uh, these adversities? That's the adversity quotient. And uh, coming back to our cycle again, ups and downs. Uh, in order to really uh, understand our mind, you need to sort of flatten the curve like uh, we are trying to do with Corona, you need to find some what of a stability uh, in order to really try to understand. Same example, if you are in a stream of emotions, while you're struggling in the stream of emotions, you really can't enjoy, you really, really can't try to understand the uh, make of the river. You need to be more settled. But on the other hand, if you're on a uh, tire tube or an inflatable uh, uh, object, that you can just uh, lean on, you can try to understand the river better, right? Because you are not struggling with the emotions, you are not carried away by the emotions, you are just observing emotions. So that's a better footing to uh, sort of understand our mind, understand our uh, existence. So, um, so when this happens, uh, we go on highs, we go on lows, but if we use this some coping mechanism uh, in order to flatten our curve, it could be anything. And I have seen uh, most of the time, uh, over the last month, a few people uh, approached me uh, saying that they want to commit suicide, right? And when they did that, uh, we have this uh, a thing where we chant uh, 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 Pirit uh, every day from uh, 6.30 to 7.30 or 7.15 for 45 minutes, we do that. And uh, I found that the most effective thing a person could do is really chant Piri. Uh, come under the bow tree, uh, come to the temple, come to this very relaxing environment, and uh, station yourself there, uh, talk to a monk, and then even just uh, look at the bow tree, look at the statue, look at the Buddha, chant uh, one of these uh, uh, Piri, and then that really calms your mind down so much. Right, so I've seen the person who comes uh, 
saying I won't kill myself today and uh, after 45 minutes of chanting, he's perfectly calm, right? So I don't know what calms you, but make sense of, uh, I'm sure that you already know uh, what could have calmed you. So make use of this and find your solace, but also know that it's only temporary calmness. The moment the next adversity, the adverse effect hits you, atrocity hits you, you're going to get agitated again. Knowing that, still try to find your solace um, by doing something which should uh, help you. So, uh, supporting or support from uh, people who are around you is one of the key things in uh, trying to find uh, solace in this uh, grieving process. So, it could be even a group of people or it could be your relatives. In fact, uh, Sri Lankan culture, I should say, is uh, quite... Uh, uh, beautiful in this manner uh, when someone is uh, uh, dead you know if, if, it's, if there's a funeral house there's this thing that uh, you don't uh, leave the funeral house unattended or you don't close the doors for the next seven days right there could be many reasons why they don't do it uh, but I see that one of the things is that uh, more than for the dead it's a great help for the living it's a great way that they could uh, look at the corpse, they could really try to uh, come back to the reality that this person has uh, left us and uh, also have this fantastic support group, very closely knit uh, relatives, friends uh, who comes and uh, uh, try to solace ourselves and we share our grief, uh, we share our memories and through that we find solace, right? And uh, even humor, I have seen in uh, many funeral houses, uh, the most affected person sometimes uh, cracks a joke and the next time uh, he or she uh, bursts in tears, feel bad about uh, cracking a joke. But doing all that helps you move on, right? Uh, some of the bad things that you could do is actually uh, uh, the opposite of this, trying to escape from uh, uh, this. In fact, uh, most of the people that uh, who have approached uh, me who have troubled minds, I have seen that there are people who have who do not have uh, close friends. Uh, they do not have friends where they open themselves up. Right? Uh, Buddha knew, Buddha uh, knew all uh, uh, areas of the mind. He even, suggest, he even imposed this as a ritual for the monks, as uh, Vinaya Karma, as Pohoya Karma. Tomorrow, uh, we will be doing the Pohoya Karma. And uh, one of the key things is that, is that you share uh, what you have done, uh, uh, what you have thought with your uh, colleagues, with your peers, with your fellow monks. And again, you don't share it with uh, uh, the next person you are going to see, but you do it with uh, certain people who can uh, uh, be helped you, who are trustworthy, who are not going to make use of uh, uh, the information that you're going to uh, say, uh, but essentially in this process, you have to open up and you have to share. You have to share it with someone. Uh, in fact, you hear a lot of stories that whenever someone tries to get into meditation, some people get into meditation and they end up uh, uh, lunatic, you know, they go crazy. Um, I think if you really open up, follow the uh, way of Buddha, uh, if you we, uh, we have a system, we have a uh, infrastructure to share our thoughts. Um, as a layman, you might not have that, but if you have a similar supporting structure where you can uh, share your thoughts, what's really inside your mind, if you can uh, put uh, one by one on the table. Uh, when I was young, I had this uh, doll, it was uh, from Russia, it, I think it's called Matrushka, where it's made out of bamboo, where you have to open it, and then there's a smaller door, and then you remove it half, uh, remove the top half, and there's a, even a smaller door. So you keep on uh, removing one by one, and until you find a very small door. Our mind is also like an onion; it has so many layers. When we peel one by one, of course, peeling is hurting. We cry. We uh, it makes us uh, happy or it makes us sad. But when we start peeling one by one, we see that uh, there's so many layers to our mind. And uh, only when we start sharing these things, uh, these things come out. 
where suppressed feelings which have been bottled uh, since our childhood, since uh, our traumatic events, they come out one by one and then you find release. Uh, you know, you find release. Uh, it's like when you are, uh, when you have the urge to urinate, for example, when you have to stay, uh, when you can't uh, do that, it's so uncomfortable, right? But when you can uh, use the loo, you feel such a relief. Same with our emotional uh, bottled up emotions. When you find a vent to it, when you share it, you will find such a relief, such a solace. So escaping is uh, probably not a good thing to do uh, when you're grieving. And then again, uh, people get into many other reactive behaviors like self-soothing. Now it can be from a um, eating uh, pattern. When you're sad, you try to uh, eat a lot. Could be even uh, drinking a lot, using uh, toxicants, you know, alcohol, uh, whatever, smoking. You could uh, go into that uh, that sort of things. And uh, uh, often, uh, some people can even try uh, very compulsive behaviors, like very risk-taking behaviors. Uh, I'm sad, so in order to get my mind off this breakup, I'm driving the vehicle so fast, risking uh, people on the people on the road, risking myself risking so many other lives. I'm uh, doing risky things. People could even end up uh, self-harming themselves. So these are not really good uh, things to things for us, for, uh, things for a grieving person to do. But if that happens, uh, sometimes it happens. And again, let me tell you, although I said uh, escaping is not a good thing, it totally depends on the individuality. For example, uh, I'll, I'll share a story of mine, a personal story of mine. I was uh, married and then uh, at one point I left, uh, left my wife and the child. And that was one of the most uh, traumatic events I have faced. I mean, I have faced a lot of other traumatic events, but this was the most emotionally uh, difficult uh, event that I faced, leaving the child. And when that happened, I sort of uh, went into a cave um, I was trying to solve that problem myself. But I know for a fact that uh, compared to many people, I somewhat have a strong and a resilient mind. And uh, the best way for me to move on from something is to be alone. But I, I have seen at the same time for many people, it's not the case. Uh, if you are left alone, you could be going into very self-destructive uh, patterns, behaviors, habits, right? So, uh, when you are grieving and when you have to move on, for some people it might work, but for some people it could be very uh, dangerous. And uh, again, uh, I am no judge. I can't tell what really uh, fits you. Uh, it's up to you. But what's more important is to find support from people around you. Like uh, a monk, uh, like when we do the Vinaya Karma, we seek advice of uh, our peer monks, of our teachers, we share what's in our mind as well as we uh, seek uh, for advice, right? We don't do it every day, but we at least make, a, make it a point that we do it once a month on the poetry, right? So similarly, as layman, I think uh, even if your style is not really open up, it's still important that you find one day per month uh, to share your most uh, deepest emotions, deepest sorrows with someone or some people. That's very important. Now, having said all these uh, behaviors, let me uh, uh, draw our discussion to this thing. Uh, the only thing really we could uh, do in any of these adverse situations is really observe ourselves, right? And that's the very cave that we do not want to enter. We are so afraid of looking into our mind, right? We are really afraid of doing that. In fact, in fact, all those behaviors I mentioned, uh, fleeing from the uh, incident, numbing yourself from, for the emotions, you know, sometimes you numb yourself to the emotions, right? You are internally so agitated, but uh, from the external, you numb yourself to the emotion. That's not a good healing. Uh, all these things uh, we do is because we don't, do not want to leave the comfort of our own thought chain. No matter how adverse it is, we do not want to leave the comfort of our thoughts. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you it in another way. 
I think it's a natural reaction of uh, every human being that we do not want to leave our comfort zone. As a child, we want to be in our cot, the cozy cot, or the arms of our mother. Uh, when we grow up, we do not want to venture into other territories where we are not comfortable with. And uh, what it could be physical, but uh, most importantly, uh, what we really can't leave is the comforts of our mind. And often, that's the personal philosophy we have. We never do not want to leave our personal philosophy, right? But we have believed as uh, correct, what we have believed as uh, reality, what we have believed as truth. We do not want to leave that. And uh, the only way to really leave it is to understand that we are in it, right? For example, I'm sure that you know, you still remember Yala and uh, Vilpattu. Uh, natural reserves. If you are in Yala and if you want to come out of the jungle, you first need to understand where you are located at. And the first step is knowing where you are. And that's how uh, you know whether you are supposed to uh, go up north uh, or go down south. Right? Uh, if you are in Vilpattu, if you go up north, you'll be going towards uh, Jaffna, not Colombo. If you are in Yala, if you go towards south, you'll be reaching the beach a dead day. So, the paramount importance, the, the most important thing that one could do uh, about uh, finding our comfort zone or about understanding our comfort zone is trying to understand what we are really in. And uh, I see that most of the time, uh, individually, it's a very challenging task. You need uh, help from an external person, an external event, uh, external sermon. Uh, you need, the, need this external... Uh, uh, something to show where you are standing. And uh, uh, I see throughout the discourse of Buddha, that's what uh, he has been trying to do. Whenever someone is uh, residing on his own uh, comfort zone, Buddha would challenge it. For example, uh, Satchaka. There's this uh, great philosopher called Satchaka. Buddha would challenge his stance and uh, come up with an argument where his original argument is no more valid. Right, so he's uh, he's shaken, of course, and he has to leave the comfort zone of his uh, own self, own mind. Right. Why I'm saying this is that uh, if you are really lamenting, many of these things would not uh, really matter. But again, if you look at uh, look at it like uh, Dharmapala Brahmana, the only thing you can really do is uh, try to accept the reality. And uh, before accepting the reality, you would have to look into yourself, what is reality, right? And when, uh, when we say what is reality, it's basically it's our experience, it's our conscious experience, what we hear, what we touch, what we see, what we perceive, right? And uh, one could say that uh, I see a flower in front of me. It's a beautiful uh, daisy, right? Uh, Am I really seeing a daisy or is it the uh, uh, mind telling me it's a daisy based on my previous uh, memories, right? If you try to rationalize it, you would, you would see that uh, seeing is also the experience of seeing. I'm not talking about the actual seeing of, uh, uh, of light coming to your eye, etc., etc. I'm not talking about the physical phenomenon of that, but I'm talking about the experience of seeing. Experience of seeing is actually part of our mind. Seeing is part of our mind. Smelling, touching, sensing is part of our mind. Our own uh, past, I'm not talking about the past which has really happened, uh, but the experience of past is part of our mind. And uh, if this is our existence, if this is the mansion that we are woken up tomorrow morning, all of a sudden, totally unfamiliar surrounding, if we are to master this, the only way to master this is trying to observe uh, what is this made out of. Essentially, what is our mind is made out of. What is the uh, building block of our, of our mind? I'm again not talking about uh, fancy um, technical terms, right? I'm not talking about Chitta uh, Viti, uh, Aticca Samuppada, Chitta Chaitasika Khanda, uh, in Dhamma Sangani Prakarnia, for example, if you go, it's such an in-detailed uh, document of our entire 
uh, psyche of how, of how we think, how we perceive, how uh, one thought would lead to the other. But we don't need to go into that detail, right? We can just start observing what we really feel now, what's crossing our mind now. So for example, if you are in the process of lamenting, all you can do is that I am reacting to this loss in denial. I'm reacting to this loss in uh, anger. I'm not asking you not to be angry. I'm just asking only to uh, observe this anger, observe this denial, observe this depression. Right? I'm not asking you to not do any of those things because whether I tell or whether I don't tell, that's your natural reaction. And no matter how much I tell, no matter how many uh, advices you get, eventually it's, uh, it's, it boils down, boils down to you. You are the one who's going to uh, execute it and uh, you are going to think the way you are going to think, right? So uh, no matter how much I say, you are going to change that. So I'm not even asking you to change that. The only thing I'm asking you to is to really observe what you are doing. What is your experience? What are you perceiving? Are you feeling anger? Are you feeling uh, grief? Are you feeling frustration? Just observe it. Why? Again, this is the same uh, dark cave. This is the dark mansion. This is the unfamiliar surrounding, unfamiliar setting that we fear to enter. But we also, uh, from our bottom of our hearts, we wish to seek uh, liberation of. It's not uh, someone else's mansion, it's our own mansion. So in order to uh, find liberation, first we need to understand it. And the only way to understand it is to be familiar with our experience. Right? So I don't know if this helped uh, or if it made even sense uh, what I said. Um, all that we can do uh, in grieving, number one is find solace in any way that is available. Again, when I say any way, not a self-destructive way, uh, or uh, which doesn't uh, uh, disturb the peace of someone else, right? We need to think about how other people uh, would be affected. So we are not going to harm anyone else. We are not going to harm ourselves. Within these parameters, you can try out anything that uh, gives you peace, gives you temporary uh, solace, and how you could uh, flatten your uh, 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 your rough emotions, you know, very uh, powerful emotions, how, how you can calm down yourself. And, so, and once you have calmed down, um, try to observe what are your emotions like during all these uh, episodes. And uh, towards the end, you will see that uh, the person who has departed has departed. What has really changed is our mind. That's, uh, that's all what has changed. And uh, now, since we have observed, we know uh, the length and breadth of our mind. And uh, I'll take one final example that uh, when I was uh, a layman, I, I used to do surfing. And uh, anyone who's familiar with the beach, you would know that uh, uh, there's a place where the, the wave breaks, uh, where you see the white foam, and the wave breaks. Uh, often that, that's the place where it's the most uh, hardest to even stay. You know, it's very rough, it's very agitated. It's very uh, difficult to stay there. But uh, if you have a inflatable uh, thing or a surfboard, you go a little towards the sea and uh, uh, further away towards the sea from the place where the surf breaks. When you're right in the middle of the ocean, when this swells up and down, all that, uh, you can just look up and you're so calm. That place is not uh, um, agitated, but it's really in the middle of the sea, deep in the sea, but that place is not agitated, right? All you have to do is observe the swells coming up, up going down, uh, and you are in a um, transient, uh, peaceful, calm, observation uh, mode, you are not getting agitated like when you are at the surf break. So my uh, wish is that if any one of you is uh, affected uh, by something, some uh, adversity, starting from a broken waist to a broken heart to someone who has departed us, 
go towards the sea go to that uh, dark cave where you fear to enter right go to that sea where you fear to uh, step into because uh, where the surf breaks it's very uh, it's very uh, agitated there's a lot of uh, emotions there's a lot of everything but once you go further once you dwell further and further into your own emotions you would find peace there right at the same time uh, find your support group uh, find your peer whom you could share and uh, try out uh, anything which is not harming yourself or harming others to get over this uh, aggravated uh, emotions so with that with that initial uh, discussion i would like to open the stage for any questions you have uh, about uh, all these things and again uh, i'm not talking about something uh, uh, which is totally out of our day to day experience right i'm talking the only pertaining to the experience so uh, if you ask me about uh, uh, a serious technical thing like uh, uh you know something which is said uh, said in the dhamma sangani prakarne or vibhaga prakarne about uh, uh, different chitta uh, kand i might i might not be able to answer that but one thing i'm very confident of answering is about my mind because uh, i know that so i'm very familiar about answering that and i believe that because i know my mind uh, it's easy for me to answer uh, for questions about your mind because i think eventually uh, we more or less have the same mind pattern maybe not the same content of mind but the same mind pattern so with that, with that i would like to uh, open the forum for any questions you have about this uh, sir Anurag Tero, uh, uh, do you have any comments, questions uh, from the audience? I think Anurag Tero, there is no question right up to now. No, <laughs> even no, the messages are there. I think you can write up the the sermon if there are no other questions. Okay, so I will take it as that uh, either you understood uh, what I have been telling. Uh, or oh, you totally did not understand uh, what I was uh, trying to tell you. But either way, either way, if you have found peace in uh, getting onto this Zoom discussion and trying to, uh, you know, uh, find an answer to a burning question you had, I think that's all what matters. Whether you understood it or didn't understand it, it doesn't matter. At least uh, you had a nice gathering of uh, Zoom uh, meeting. uh that's all that matters and with that i would uh, uh move on to the transferring of merits uh uh for today so uh this week uh, the meeting was sponsored this week sponsors are uh, upali and cecilia jaykodi uh we should uh, be thankful to them upali and cecilia jaykodi and uh, with that uh, uh i would like to uh, share the merits with the departed relatives teachers uh, friends our employees employees employers uh, our enemies people that we don't like people that we love uh, our personal deities devas brahmas and uh, all beings in all realms anyone in uh, any direction any realm so uh, i would like uh, if you can uh, chant with me idam vinya tidam hotu to transfer it so let's chant with me idam vinya tidam hotu sukita hontu nateyo idam vinya tidam hotu sukita hontu nateyo idam vinya tidam hotu sukita hontu nateyo ittarta ja ammehi sampadam punya sampadam sabbe deva anumodantu sabda sampatti siddhiya ettavata cha ammehi sampadam punya sampada sabbe bhuta anumodantu sabda sampatti siddhiya 
ഇത്താവതാജ അമ്മേഹി സംപദം പുണ്യ സംപദം സബ്ദേ സത്ത അനുമോദന്തു സബ്ദ സമ്പത്ത് സിദ്ധിയ മേ ഓൾ may the power of all the kusala that you have gained all the merit you have gained uh, through uh, by obtaining uh, the five precepts today and uh, by trying to awaken your wisdom uh, through these sermons and uh, the meditation that you do may all this uh, merit uh, be a reason for our departed uh, relatives uh, our departed friends uh people who have departed uh, this world because of this uh, corona and uh, many people uh who would uh, many people who who has uh, departed already who would be departed in the future and uh, for all the people who are who are seeking uh, to heal our minds to see uh, us, to heal our uh, souls to heal our experiences may all this merit be transferred to everyone to all the living beings in all realms uh, to find peace and fulfillment and liberate from your own mind own samsara and uh, i wish may everyone attain supreme bliss of nirvana let me uh, chant for you abhivadana silis nichan mudda pachayino ചത്താരോ ധമ്മ വണ്ടി ആയു വണ്ണോ സുകമ്പലം ആയുരാരോഗ്യ സമ്പത്തി സബ്ദ സമ്പത്തി മേവച്ച് അതോ നിപ്പാനു സമ്പത്തി ഇമിനാത്തെ സമിച്ചു